Hello and welcome to our London History Podcast, where we share our love of London, its people, places and history in 20-minute espresso shot episodes served with a dash of personality. I am Hazel Baker, qualified London tour guide and CEO of London Guided Walks, providing private tours, treasure hunts and live London quizzes to Londoners and visitors alike. To accompany this podcast, we also have hundreds of London history-related blog posts for you to enjoy at londonguidedwalks.co.uk forward slash blog. And it's a week for celebrating as we have hit the amazing milestone of 3,000 listeners. Now, I am beyond proud and thankful not only for you, my lovely listeners, but also for our expert guests for sharing their love of London. Now, don't forget, if you want to be a guest, then please do get in touch via our website, londonguidedwalks.co.uk forward slash podcast. Don't forget, from 4th of July, we will be offering private tours, treasure hunts and live London quizzes to private groups, all COVID-19 secure. And now, on with the show. Joining me from across the pond is author Mila Johansson. I'm very excited to talk about her latest book, Cowgirl to Congress. And this is all about her dear grandmother, Jessie, and her time in England, who was a very good friends with Lady Astor and knew George Bernard Shaw and H.G. Wells. So Mila, this project must have been really fascinating, understanding your grandmother's world and the which she lived both in the States and then again in London. So how, how did this project come about? I was partially raised by my grandmother, Jessie Haver Butler, who was a famous suffragette on the front lines in 1920 when women in the US won the right to vote. And I was closest to her than anyone. So when she passed away, all of her archives were sent to my house. And I didn't really start going through them until a few years ago because I was so busy having a child and writing plays and books and teaching. And when we went through it, my niece and I, we found 19 letters, probably the largest collection in the world from Lady Astor to Jesse. They were best friends. And after the women won the vote, Jesse went to England because her husband got a big job in the London Embassy. She met Lady Astor through the London Embassy because Lady Astor, I didn't realize until I wrote the book, was a woman from Virginia, an American. Okay. And she became the first woman to sit in Parliament. And she sat there for 28 years. And, you know, it was an accident how she got in there. Her husband was sitting in the seat and his father died and he had to go into the House of Peers. House of, you probably know that story. And he said, Nancy, just sit in my seat. I'm, I'm sure I'll be back in two years. I'll get out of this. And he never did. So she sat there for 28 years. And it's amazing. She actually won the vote with 51% of the vote. <laughs> and, and they weren't very happy to have her there because they weren't used to women. And anyway, she, my grandmother attended many of her balls. She'd have like... 2,000 people, she'd serve them dinner and everything. And Emmeline Pankhurst was in line in front of my grandmother one day. Uh And she met the man who wrote Peter Pan. So after this huge career in Washington, D.C., she had started the Pulitzer School of Journalism with one other professor Mm -hmm. at Columbia. And she was the first woman lobbyist at the Capitol in D.C. And she worked with Alice Paul and Carrie Chapman Catt. And so when she came to England, she wasn't sure what she was supposed to do. And so she and my grandfather attended, I think it was three summers at the Fabian Summer School with George Bernard Shaw. Yeah. And they had a great time. They were so happy they did that because they realized right away when they got to London that that people in England were really different from Americans and they didn't fit in. And they had some big mistakes they made, like my grandfather said, can you imagine they stop everything at three and have tea? Well, I will stop that because it's not functional. Well, and Jesse said, well, Hugh, you know, you, you may enjoy tea later. So he did, of course, and we couldn't change that. And so when they went to the Fabian Summer School, they got a huge glance into really what was going on in England because they had all these lectures from people from all over the world, but especially all over England. And George Bernard Shaw became extremely interested in Jesse because she knew all about prohibition. And as you probably know, George Bernard Shaw was a teetotaler. And a bit That's different. right. Yes. And Lady Esther really pushed for increasing the age limit for drinking, which was 14. And then it went up, yeah. So she was on the same lines of this. 
She was, and Jesse said that hardly any of them drank. So Lady Astor wouldn't serve drinks at her balls, except for once in a while she'd have a separate room where if people had to drink, they could go in there and do it. Mm. Have you been round uh, Lady Astor's house? No, I have not been to Cliveden. I have pictures of it that Lady Astor sent on postcards to Jesse. Have you been there? Oh, yes, yeah. so I've been to Cliveden in Buckinghamshire. But also, while Lady Astor was in the house, she acquired a number four St. James's Square, which is not too far from Whitehall at all. Well, half the letters to Jesse are from that address. They are from that address, and half are from Cliveden. Excellent. Yeah, so uh, so uh, for St. James's Square, um, a lot of Londoners will know this, there's a blue plaque outside. And this is a a beautiful building. And I have been to parties there, so I can imagine how fantastic it would have been for your grandmother to uh, be standing in these rooms with receptions up to a thousand in the London one, (laughs) rather than two thousand in the country. Let me ask you, you, when you went to um, the one on James... Was the ballroom upstairs? That's what Jesse says in the book. That's right. That's it. So you, you walk up these wide stairs and then you go back on yourself. And then there's like a smaller room on the left. And if you walk straight, which is basically back onto facing the square, that is the large ballroom. So you get all the evening light. It's really quite magical. So it's a club now, so maybe you'll be able to, uh, if you come over, maybe you'll be able to have a little look around. I would love to go there and Clive Thin, and they also had their home in her contingency, Portsmouth? Yes. Yeah, she had a home there too. <laughs> I, I don't have the book in front of me. Well, I have it, but I'm not reading it. No, it's all right. All right, there's Portsmouth, but she was, um, Lady Astor was a member of Parliament for Plymouth, which isn't too far away. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Oh, well, it's by the sea and starts with a P, so you're, you're close enough. <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So well, the house in St. James's Square, if I kind of help, it's uh, it's really quite exquisite. It also has a little garden, which people kind of don't realise, because on the back of the house, it goes on to Haymarket, the uh, the Regency streets that um, John Nash developed um, in the in the early 1800s. So this was a very uh, posh street. And of course, this house was already there. It'd already been there for 50 years. And when they moved in, basically what you see now is what you would have seen then. It's been kept intact really, really well. Um, And it's very exciting going in. You do feel that you're entering a ye old world. So that's lovely. But yes, so I have a problem with your grandmother. In reading the book, it says that your grandmother describes us Brits as shy and modest and badly dressed. <laughs> the cheek of it. Who was she describing at that point? I think, well, she's saying in the daytime, us Brits are quite shabby. And then in the <laughs> evening, we put on our glitz and we show the world off. <laughs> And one, and she has a story in her book how she was invited to dinner to one of the Lord's houses, and he seemed more down to earth, and and he said this is just a casual dinner, and so they went in very casual clothes, dress dress and suit, of course, and when they got there, everyone was dressed to the nines for dinner, and they had a big lesson that when people say they're having a casual dinner in their shack, it's a proper dinner in a palace, so. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, it's it's funny how we kind of dumb things down. But even when it's smart casual, it's never the casual side of smart casual. (laughs) But um, yeah, so yeah, so you mentioned about James Barry. Uh, You also you mentioned uh, one of the parties where Winston Churchill's there as well. Yes, and of course we know Lady Astor and Winston Churchill had an ongoing battle at all times. Indeed to her balls because he could meet all his people who all the political associates and Jesse always said that Lady Astor ran it just like a political party almost and she had so much own fun at her own parties it's amazing stories about Lady Astor you know later on Lady Astor wrote the foreword for Jesse's book that she wrote about public speaking time to speak up mm-hmm. and Eleanor Roosevelt wrote a testimonial on the back of it It's quite amazing, really, how all these women who had their own particular focuses on life were able to connect and strengthen each other's individual battles as well. 
Yes, well, and you know, I didn't realize this but, but until I wrote the book, or I was going through her book and rewriting it, that Alice Paul, an American, a Quaker from a very wealthy family in America, attended the London School of Economics and got her PhD there. And that's where she met Emmeline Pankhurst and became a radical feminist. Oh, mm-hmm. well, it's, it's great to join these dots, isn't it? I mean, when I was reading your book, I was thinking it's a bit like four weddings and a funeral, but uh, yeah. the opposite. <laughs> I named a chapter like that, right? I went, what I say? Four funerals and a ball, three funerals and a ball. Well, yes, yes. So, um, well, when you mentioned about Mrs. H.G. Wells' uh, cremation, but also the wonderful Ellen Terry, also cremated at Golders Green, which I didn't know about. Yeah. Well, I thought it was really quite interesting how your grandmother's life seemed to split between Westminster with the embassy and, and Lady Astor's house and that, and then also Golders Green where she lived and where the services were being held as well. Yes, and I thought it was very interesting that she witnessed H.G. Wells' relationship with George Bernard Shaw, who she already knew. George was so impressed with her that he had her speak with him several times all over London. I think you saw in the book I have the actual announcement of her speaking at Essex Hall. Yes. And then the article afterwards, there's an article, I, I it was so old and so little, I, I didn't put it in the book, but I typed it in about how George loved the speech. And he loved anything about prohibition because he wanted his ideas to go forward with other people speaking about it. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the best way, though, isn't it? You can, there's only so much you can do on your own little soapbox. Exactly, exactly. And he promoted speakers. That's what the whole Fabian Summer School is about. There'd just be speaker after speaker. And Jessie wasn't even the professional speaker she became later at that point. She was good, but she became a much better speaker when she returned to America and she went and got her master's or something at Georgetown in near D.C., And then she wrote her book, Time to Speak Up, because one of the premier speakers in America, a man, said, we have no book for a woman and I'd love you to write it. So he kind of gave her an assignment to write that book. And this book Mm -hmm. that I've written, From Cowgirl to Congress, is one third of it does take place in England, which I love reading about England. Yeah, and it's lovely, from my point of view, seeing... London in the the 1920s. I mean, her description of uh, Queen Mary (laughs) and her all buttoned up blue dress. (laughs) With the turban, with the turban. Yes, yes, exactly. And then, and that that hat as well, that iconic hat. Yes, and the story from the garden party is so funny that when I go and do public lectures, I always tell that story and get a big laugh from everyone. Yeah, I mean, it is that kind of thing, though, that uh, really nearly 100 years later and we're still saying, oh, they did that because they're American. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, I'm putting on another book later called Dear Lady Astor, and it's going to be the letters between Jesse and Nancy Astor. And the interesting thing is they both were trying to build bridges because there was a huge, and I didn't realize this before, animosity between the USA and England. And they thought, we're so similar. We need each other. We need to do trade with each other. And, you know, they were a lot about money and labor. And Mm -hmm. both of them were trying to give the parliamenticians on both sides the idea that we need to build more bridges, not tear them down. Yeah. Well, I think the same could be said for today as well. (laughs) Yes, with everybody, right? (laughs) You know, a really great thing, you probably read it, but I love the story in there when she goes to be presented at court. Of course, the last court in 1928 that ever happened. She bought her dress for 40 pounds and everybody else had probably spent $2,000 on their dresses. And hers was the only dress that was written up and described in the London and New York Times. Well, that's got to say something, hasn't it? You can't buy everything, but you can buy a dress to get talked about. Exactly. I'm a big thrift store person. And so that story is one. I have her big picture of her and Jesse, her and Hugh being presented at the court of St. James's. And I always bring my friends into the room and tell them the story about the dress. Yes. Well, I think there's so many rules to follow and how long your train is and and all the rest of it. So you've got to nail it. And then, of course, everyone, as you said, has spent a huge amount of money um, investing in these 
these girls to be represented. So uh, you've got to do something to catch the eye. And she also heard, had been reading that the queen loved all them lilies, um, calla lilies, we call them. And so she made her flowers calla lilies instead of the traditional types of flowers. I think there was, a, there was a marketer in there somewhere as well, you know, mentioning about the lilies and then also her comment about the, the housekeeping. She understood didn't, people, didn't she? Yes. And, you know, she wasn't afraid to take advice and listen to people. She was a little bit of a bulldozer, my grandmother, in a way, because as a woman back then, you kind of had to bulldoze your way into being a lobbyist in D.C., right? Mm -hmm. And so she was that way. But she was also a great parliamentarian. She was the one person who lobbied for the first minimum wage for women. And she had to go in and meet with a very gruff senator. And she won him over because she went canoeing and he had gone canoeing. And so he became her friend for life and said, I will help you get any measure through you want. And he was her secret weapon at the Capitol. And at that point, I can't believe this, but everybody could walk into any room and go to any meeting and even speak at him in the Capitol building. And so it was an amazing time back then. And so she could be, she was a great parliamentarian and she loved to listen to people. She loved to take classes and learn from everybody. And she valued all her life what she learned in England and in London. She thought she had learned more skills about living a life as a wife and a mother. And she hailed England all her life. I mean, we're talking about her life lessons. What has been your life lesson with reading these letters and learning more about your your grandmother? Well, my grandmother, you know, raised me and she was a suffragette all the way to age 94. Her last speech she made at 94 in her early 90s, she took me along when she spoke with Gloria Steinem and Marlo Thomas in Hollywood several times. And when she passed away, the Now Women National Organization of Women came to me and said, oh, are you going to march in her place? And I was young. I was 18 or 20 or something. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. I'm already free. My grandmother told me I'm free from all the work she already did. I'm emancipated. I was kind of young and I didn't understand mm -hmm. politics then. And so I walked my own way. But now, now, Hazel, I am yeah. just like her. I speak out against pesticide and GMO. And mm -hmm. I'm a little unpopular because I really speak out for that. And I'm an organic farmer. I'm, I grew up in L.A. and gangland, but I ended up marrying organic farmer up here in Northern California. And so I'm just like her now. And I know if she was still here, that would be her issue that she would take on as well. Well, that's really awesome to have that connection. It's lovely that you knew her so well, but it's also nice for you to know your grandmother as a woman in her own right, if you if you know what I mean, rather than just your gram. You know, it's funny because when she was my grandmother, she was an older woman who smelt a little funny, mm -hmm. had big hats, a lot of jewelry. And as I'm reading the book, I'm realizing she was the hip person of her time. She was like the Amy Goodman of her time. She mm -hmm. was she was brilliant and she was always on the edge of everything. And as much as I knew her and loved her and we were so close, I didn't know that side of her until I tackled this book. Well, it's a good job that you had those letters and you were able to dedicate some time to unraveling some of her, not secret, but her unknown life on that. And of course, the, uh, the book in itself is very easy, and very pleasurable to read. And it's, it's lovely reading through the eyes of a foreigner and seeing how quirky we Brits really are. And I'm kind of proud of that. Well, and I know to be a fly on the wall. And, and here we're having the 100th anniversary on August 18th here of women winning the vote. And as yeah. I was writing it, I realized that I didn't realize it when I first started writing it. It was kind of iconic and synchronistic. And then I found out and I was too late that Lady Astor had her 100th anniversary of going into Parliament last year. So I, I, felt, oh, I missed it, you know. <laughs> Well, there's always an anniversary for something, so I can, I'm sure we can. And don't forget, also, in, what, eight years' time, it'll be Emmeline Pankhurst's funeral anniversary as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, and also when all the British women got the vote, right, in 1928. That's right. Yeah, it's a big year, so there'll be a lot to talk about then. So you'll have to get your second book out for then. Hey, that's a great idea, Hazel. You're exactly right. I'll get it out 
way before. The letters between them are fantastic. There's these really fun letters in there where Lady Astor says, stop talking to me about blackberries. I have a hankering for jam. It makes my mouth water. <laughs> yeah, when I read that um, Lady Esther's comment, it made me really want to read those letters and find out exactly what was going on because uh, I felt that I was missing out big time. <laughs> well, it's funny because it's fly on the wall. You know, I don't think there are that many letters. I looked at a museum and they had about five letters from her. And of course, with her best friend, Lawrence of Arabia, he, she, there were a lot of letters from them back and forth, but they're but 19 is a lot from Lady Astor. Yeah. And her grandmother, luckily, she made copies of all her letters. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. I mean, in Lawrence of Arabia, he also lived not too far from where Emmeline Pankhurst's uh, funeral was, St. John's Church hmm. in Smith Square. And um, he literally lived the next street down. And that was quite easy walking distance to where Lady Astor lived as well, through St. James's Park. So it's funny how all of these things become connected. You can start mapping people's lives out. Yes, and I'm, I have a terrible interest in England. I wrote a novel called The Four Thieves, and it's all about Ludlow, the castle of Ludlow, and, yep, yep. and what saved Catherine of Aragon and her husband, who perished, of course, from the sweating sickness. I love English history. Philippa Gregory has given us a glimpse into everything before Henry VIII. And I've studied very much Shakespeare. I teach a lot of Shakespeare, but I really love all the stories of the Queens and Henry, the, all the Henrys. I'm well versed in it. And I, I love history like you do. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I think we can learn so much from history. If we know where we've been, we know where we're going. I wish more people knew that. Yes. If you've enjoyed this episode, then please do take a few moments and leave a review. It is very much appreciated. Thanks again and see you next time.